So welcome to this hot of the press talk. I'm Pietro Oliveto from the University of Sheffield. And this is joint work with Don Koritz, Andrei Lisovoy, and Karsten Bitt. Um, I was invited uh, by the editor in, in chief of the, uh, the new journal ACM Transactions on Evolutionary Learning and Optimization to present this paper, which has appeared in the first issue of the journal. Given the time constraints, I'm just going to give you an appetizer of the paper. So I guess it is fair to say that the idea behind the invention of evolutionary and genetic algorithms is uh, that if evolution works so well in nature, then why not imitate it to evolve solutions to our computational problems? So what is the outcome <clears throat> of uh, evolution? So one of the main points of Darwin's theory is that uh, from an initial few forms of life, or maybe even only one, um, evolution has evolved uh, wide variety of different species. However, evolutionary algorithms do not really be display this behavior, even though you would expect them to. And if there is one message I want you to take away from this talk, is that what we argue in this paper is that the reason is that in traditional evolutionary algorithms, the selective pressure that was used was too high. And in particular, in the paper, we argue why instead of KTAs, parent selection should prefer worse individuals compared rather than better ones. So this is not really news. So at least the argument that evolutionary algorithms do not evolve different species of individuals so David Goldberg, in his uh, famous book, when introducing niche and speciation, finds it curious that he has not observed um, subpopulations of strings or species, if you like, um, in different areas of the function. And in fact, he argues that to use diversity mechanisms to help um, genetic algorithms create these species. So this is generationally uh, GAs. Uh, what about steady state GAs? So Goldberg and Deb in the first FOGA conference argue that even if uh, uniform selection is used, so no positive selection towards better individuals, um, the steady state GAs um, have higher selective pressure than generational ones. And if you do use some positive selection, for example, tournament or ranking selection, you get even more increased premature convergence, which is why Darrell Whitley, who was one of the inventors of steady state EAs, was trying, according to Goldberg and Deb, to use large populations and multiple populations. So what we argue in this paper, and provide plenty of evidence regarding this, is that it is not necessary to introduce diversity uh, to uh, artificially to uh, decrease the selective pressure, but in, in the steady state model, at least, with, you can decrease the selective pressure and with the right selective pressure, evolution will automatically evolve the species by itself. So to make our point, we just look at the standard mu plus one steady state EA, where we have a population of new individuals and at each generation we select one initially with standard uniform selection, then we uh, create an offspring by flipping each bit of probability one over n and kick out from the population the worst out of the mu plus one individuals and repeat the loop. And to prove our point, we look at the two max function, where we have two slopes, two symmetric slopes, and two optima, one on the old zeros bit string and one on the old ones bit string. And the point is that it is uh, very difficult for a population to evolve both optima because they are uh, as far away as possible one from the other. Why do we look at this function? Well, as a starting point, it is the function that David Goldberg <clears throat> used in his book to illustrate the need for diversity because these species were not evolving naturally. 
and also it is the function that has been used widely to verify how effective diversity mechanisms are. However, it was never really shown that this diversity was needed in steady state EAs. So all that was known is that if the population size is not too large, so smaller than linear, um, then the steady state EA with high probability cannot find both um, optima. So one argument could be, well, if you increase the population size, can you find both optima? The first thing we prove in the paper is that you can't. Steady state EAs will fail with high probability of identifying both optima, independent of the population size. So this is what this ugly theorem here is saying. We will not look at it. I will summarize what the theorem says. And point one is that the algorithm fails to find both optima with high probability, whatever polynomially large population size you use. But the big insight comes from the proof where we show that diversity is lost very quickly, not long after initialization. So this insight here implies two very important things. The first thing is that the algorithm turns very quickly into a single trajectory algorithm. The second thing is that since we lose diversity very quickly, the behavior is likely not only to hold for two max, but for large, um, large classes of functions. What trouble does most of all is, but shouldn't there be an evolution be evolving the two optima of two max anyway? So the question is, how do we decrease selective pressure? Uh, one, one point could be maybe the model that we're using for evolution uh, is not correct. And uh, well, ge traditional generational EAs were follow this model very strictly, where the new population that is created replaces completely the old one. From this point of view, it is crucial in generational EAs that the selection operator prefers fitter individuals to less fit individuals, because there is no other, because the new population will replace the previous one. Um, and also it is crucial in generational EAs, by the way, that the mutation rate is not too high, because if the mutation rate is high, you're very likely to create unfit individuals. However, steady state EAs do not follow the model we saw so strictly, because they create overlapping populations, and uh, <clears throat> only a subset of the population is replaced, and in particular, we, apart from selection for reproduction, we also have selection for replacement um, operator that uses elitism. So the new individuals only enter the population if they are better than the worst individuals in the parent population. This actually means that it, it is not crucial that selection prefers better individuals because of this elitism. The best individuals will be kept anyway. And indeed, typically, uh, parents are selected for reproduction uniformly at random, exploiting the fact that it is not needed to select the best ones. So what we argue in this paper is why not prefer the worst ones? As a proof of concept, let's see what happens if we select the worst individual as parent instead of a random one. So we decrease the selective pressure to its minimum. Then let's not read the theorem and again, but what this theorem says is that the algorithm now, using more or less linear population size, finds both optima of two max with overwhelming probability in a runtime that is approximately linear in the population and problem sizes. So yeah, so decreasing the selective pressure works here, we're decreasing it to a minimum, will it work in general? And the answer is no. To see this, let's consider the inverse, yeah, the truncated two max function that we de designed, where we cut one branch such that there is a local optima here now, and the only global optimum is on the other side. Now, while uniform selection steady state age will still fail on this function, what happens with the inverse elitist um, uh, selection operator? 
well, at some point, uh, the worst individual will be on the local optima here. And once this happens, then uh, it will be selected um, forever unless it manages to make a, a large jump on the other side of the third space, which could take prohibitive time. And this insight here motivates us to use stochastic selection, but favoring worse individuals. So if we have some stochasticity in the selection operator, then there is a good chance that we might select an individual uh, from this side of the branch that might create a copy or improve, and then this individual will be removed uh, by the um, selection for replacement operator. So I conclude with some experiments. Here we see uh, the standard two max function as the population size increases, the inverse elitist selection algorithm the probability of finding both optimal goes to one. As the problem size increases here, um, the uniform selection operator probability of finding both peaks goes to zero, as the theory predicted. So what happens again two max but with inverse tournament selection? We see that it performs even better. So this is uh, inverse elitist, we select the worst. If we select using various tournament sizes, we, we find both optima. The probability goes to one more quickly of finding both optima. This is uniform, which fails as we've seen earlier. If we increase the selective pressure and use tournament, we have an even lower. This is a two tournament positive, an even lower probability of finding both optima. What about truncated two max? While, while the positive selection behaves the same, inverse selecting the worst has only about a probability of a half of finding both peaks, while the inverse tournament selection operators perform very, very well. So, end of the appetizer. What we've argued is that it was already known that selective pressure of steady state age was too high. But what we argue in this paper is that with such high selective pressure, large populations do not help much, and that diversity mechanisms should not be necessary as artificial additions that should not be required in an evolutionary process. What we show is that the selective pressure may be reduced simply by increasing the probability of selecting the worst individuals and taking advantage of the fact that we've got cut selection at the end. I invite you to read the paper, but I've only given you the ideas behind the paper. In the paper, we've got lots of uh, problems we investigate. We're always using inverse tournaments of constant size. It consists in an advantage in performance. Some of you may be worried that selecting worse individuals can slow the optimization process. Well, if you've got an easy unimodal problem and you want to increase selective pressure to be faster, you just need to decrease the population size. If the problem is easy, you don't need a large population. And the last thing I would like to ask you is, uh, why don't you try changing the selection operator in your favorite steady state algorithm and maybe on your favorite applications or your important applications and see what happens. And please let us know if it improves performance or not. Thank you. <laughs>